I'm going to read the text that we'll be looking at together this morning. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let's pray. Lord, we, we come, our hearts having been filled with truth already, having sung to you and to one another truths of the gospel. And we come to this text. Words which, if you had not said, no man would dare say. That you would make your beloved son to be sin. No man is worthy to utter these things. No angel could comprehend them. And yet you have made these your words the message of ambassadors. You have said that this would be the message that your people would take to the ends of the earth. Shocking, nearly blasphemous. This is our message. This is our hope. We pray, O oh God, in these moments that you would come in power by your Holy Spirit to let us see what you have done for us in your Son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We've been in a seven-part series in 2 Corinthians, and I want to give you a little bit of a preview of, of where we're going in the pulpit uh, in the coming months. Um, we will be diving in verse by verse to the book of Revelation. That will be our next book study, but we're not going to do that until we finish the book of Daniel on Sunday nights. Daniel is foundational to the book of Revelation. I don't believe you can understand the book of Revelation without understanding Daniel. So we're going to finish Daniel on Sunday nights first before we move into the book of Revelation here on Sunday mornings. Um, that being said, in, in the meantime, we will spend some weeks going through a series of sort of apex texts, uh, that is passages of scripture uh, that are really, really, really important for the church, which is just another way to say they're some of my favorite. Um, things that I would really like to preach. And, and just by way of example, um, some of the things on that list will be uh, Galatians 6 1 and John chapter 10, John chapter 17. Um, when I think about the history of this church and, and what we've studied and what we've been through um, together in terms of book by book uh, expositions, um, I'm not sure when we will get to the book of John. Someday, <laughs> someday we need to do that. Um, but sometime before someday, uh, we need a chapter like John chapter 10 and John chapter 17. So we're going to take sneak peeks at some of those apex texts, some of my favorites, um, before we jump into the book of Revelation on Sunday mornings. So that's a little bit of a roadmap of where we're going. This morning we'll wrap up this seven-part series in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It began at the end of chapter 4 when we looked at afflictions. We discovered through the lens of eternity that afflictions are light and momentary. Then we discovered that home is heaven, that our goal is to please Christ, that our motivation is fear and love, fear of the Lord and the love of Christ. We discovered that people are in fact eternal. We learned that our business last week is reconciliation. As ambassadors for God, we are to bring about God's reconciliation, reconciling men to God. There is an ambassadorship and the ambassador carries a message that leads us to 2 Corinthians 5.21 this morning and this morning's message, which is our message. From the lens of eternity, from heaven's perspective, what ought we to say? What ought to be the language of our ambassadorship? How are we to represent our king on this earth in the few brief moments he has us here? 
That is what's in store for us in 2 Corinthians 5.21. In short, it is the gospel. Look down in 2 Corinthians 5.19. How was God reconciling the world to himself? Not counting trespasses against them. How? How could God do that? How could God not count trespasses against trespassers? If you want to imagine for a moment our own system of jurisprudence, lawbreakers and punishments, consider some heinous crime. What comes to my mind is a school shooter. Somebody who walks through the doors of unarmed masses of vulnerable young ones and carries out some insane murderous enterprise. It's hard to conceive of a more evil, heinous, wicked crime. Think for a moment what it would be like for such a guilty, evil individual to come before an unjust judge. A judge who said, you know, we've all made mistakes. And you've received a lot of ignominy and shame in the public eye. That ought to be enough. We're just going to let bygones be bygones and you can go free. What would we think of a judge like that? Evil, heinous, unjust, not good. What does it mean, God not counting their trespasses against them? How can God be both just and a justifier of sinners, as Romans 3.26 says he is? Proverbs 17, 15 says, the one who justifies the wicked is an abomination before the Lord. And yet Romans 4, 5 declares, God is the one who justifies the ungodly. How can these things be? This is the problem of the Bible, you see. That the Bible gives God's accurate, right, clear diagnosis of the human problem. This is the problem of humanity. We are all transgressors. We are all sinners. We have all violated God's perfect standards and we are all liable to his judgment. And it is the problem of God. He is holy and just. He is unflinching in his righteousness. How can God then forgive sin and maintain his reputation as good and just and holy. 2 Corinthians 5.21 gives us the answer. It is the answer to the problem of the Bible. It is the answer to the problem of man. It is the answer to the problem of God. It tells us exactly how God can be both just and a justifier of the heinous, the wicked, transgressors. And this is the content of our message to the world. A reminder in verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making appeal for us through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. How is one reconciled to God? God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The message of the ambassador is the gospel. And there's a danger of familiarity in this for us. You can walk just about any street in America and ask people, why should God let you into heaven? Oh, because I'm a pretty good guy. Because I'm not as bad as the other guy. You know, I, I'm, I, I haven't murdered anybody. And then the guys on death row think, well, the people I murdered deserved it. Everybody has a relativistic view of their own goodness and therefore dismiss the fundamental problem of sin before a holy God. And yet people will say when put to, how do you know if you've done enough? How do you know if you've been good enough? And 
And the sort of flinch response in America is, well, Jesus died for my sins. They've heard that somewhere, whether in parochial schools or on a television program, or they've heard somebody say it somewhere, and it becomes sort of the backdrop and the safety net of their conscience. I don't have to love God. I don't have to live for God. My life doesn't have to be directed towards him. I can just go on living my life, believing that I'm pretty good. And oh yeah, and Jesus died for my sins. What does that even mean? Jesus died for my sins. That is the right answer, but the dismissive statement of it, as if it hasn't radically changed your life, reveals that those who say it that way have no idea what it means. And it therefore does not apply. It is no safety net for people who otherwise think they're pretty good people. It is the only hope for those who recognize their hopeless plight before a holy God. What does it mean? Well, we need to understand the sentence that rolls off of our tongue so easily, often without thought of, of what it means about who Jesus is, what sin is like, and what God's justice requires. The verse we are about to read is perhaps the profoundest sentence in all of language. In form, it is straightforward and simple and clear, and yet its contents are incomprehensible. Its significance is immeasurable, for it is the difference between heaven and hell, and I'm convinced we will never understand it for all of eternity in its fullness. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Notice first in 2 Corinthians 5.21, there is no conjunction uh, there, there is no little word that's connecting it to the other clauses in this chapter. And, and if you read up the page in 2 Corinthians 5, most of the other clauses start with some sort of conjunction. And, therefore, for, now, those kinds of things that connect one to the other. The, the lack of conjunction here is stark, it's abrupt, it arrests the reader in his tracks, and you say, well, this stands out. And this stands out as the content of the message of ambassadorship from verse 20. And it arrests our attention this morning, and it ought to stand out. It stands as the message critical to reconciliation with God. And we need to do a little work here together as we look at this verse, make some observations. Notice there are pronouns. Pronoun is just a little word that stands in place of a noun. He, she, it, that kind of thing. There are pronouns here. He made him who... All of those are, are pronouns. Let's fill in the pronouns with the referent of the pronoun. In other words, we're going to fill in the he, she, or it with the who it is that's being talked about. By the way, this is something you should do every time you read your Bible. And you can discover the referent to the pronoun from context. This actually clears up much in Scripture. A very simple device you can use to help understand your Bible better in your daily reading. Fill in the referent to the pronoun. What are the references here? How should we read this? Verse 21, and we know this from context. God made Jesus. Jesus knew no sin. God made Jesus to be sin on believers' behalf so that believers would become the righteousness of God in Jesus. And when we fill in the pronouns, we get a clearer picture of who's doing what here. And for the sake of charting our course through this text this morning, we'll consider the passage under three headings, Jesus, God, and us. That's our outline this morning. Let's look at Jesus first. Jesus is said to be, according to 2 Corinthians 5.21, the one who knew no sin. Knew no sin. What, what does that mean for Jesus to know no sin? Does this mean he was ignorant that sin exists? Does this mean that Jesus doesn't know what sin is? No, of course not. He is God and therefore omniscient. But it simply means he does not have a relationship with sin. He doesn't know sin in the sense of being intimately acquainted with it personally. He has never sinned. He will never sin. He cannot sin. He cannot sin. 
And fundamentally, this is because Jesus the Christ is not merely a man. He, he was not just a good teacher. He was not a moralizer. He was not a hero nor a martyr. He was not an example of love or any of those mere human approaches to the person of Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Christ is fully human, yes, but also fully God. Born not in the line of Adam, and his virgin birth demonstrated that he was untainted by the corruption we all inherit from our parents, all the way back to Adam and Eve. Jesus of Nazareth is none other than the Son of God. The second person of the triune Godhead. The Word of God present with God before there was a beginning to anything. He is the agent of creation, the one who actively sustains the universe by the word of his power. He is the one who was God and with God and who took on flesh and tabernacled among us. He possesses all of the attributes of Godness and he took on all of the attributes of humanity, yet untainted by sin. Jesus never sinned. Not an outward action, not inwardly in thought or motive or inclination. Every temptation to sin was external to Jesus. There was nothing in him that sinned, nothing in him that could sin. Listen to this testimony of Scripture. Acts 3.14, he is the holy and righteous one. Hebrews 4.15, one who is tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 7.26, a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Hebrews 9.14, Christ offered himself without blemish to God. 1 Peter 1.19, he redeemed us with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. 1 Peter 2.22, Jesus committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. 1 Peter 3.18, Christ died for sins once for all time, the just in the place of the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. 1 John 3.5, you know that he appeared in order to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. One pastor said it this way, there has never been a human being on this planet of thousands of years and billions of people who for one fraction of a second loved the Lord his God with all his heart and strength. And yet, this Jesus of Nazareth, there was never one second that he did not. Jesus knew no sin. Under a second heading, let's look at God here. God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. God made Jesus to be sin for us. God is doing this work. God the Father is initiating this work. God the Father is causing God the Son to be something. And notice it does not say here, God made Jesus to sin. God made Jesus do sinning. It does not say God made Jesus to be a sinner. But very specifically, God made Jesus to be sin. This is an ontological statement. That is, it's a statement about being, about who he is or, or who he was at the cross. One scholar has said this, sin has not merely to do with our works, but our whole person in guilt and rebellion, condemned and enslaved. And so for Jesus to be sin at the cross is for him to be the embodiment of sin and guilt, not just outward activities, but sin through and through. And listen, if this verse did not say these words explicitly, we could never say it. We're on the precipice here of very dangerous thoughts. If we go too far, we blaspheme. And if we don't go far enough, we cannot be saved. There is a very narrow window of accuracy in this verse, and yet is the difference between life and death and heaven and hell of forgiveness and of remaining in our sins forever. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 constrains us to believe something astounding, a shocking work of God's grace in the gospel, that the sinless one 
became sin. The very embodiment of sin. You see, at the cross, Jesus the Christ was enveloped. He was wrapped in, clothed by, covered with sin that was not his own. The sin that he became did not belong to him. It it was not his. Sin was external to him, outside of him. He was enveloped in an unrighteousness, not of his own, derived from his being, but an unrighteousness placed on him by an act of his father. An unrighteousness that came from us. Jesus became what was totally foreign to him. This is the work of God and God alone. God is the subject of 2 Corinthians 5.21. God the Father, God made Jesus to be sin. No sinner could come up with this plan. No sinner could rightly assess the gravity of the problem of sin. You see, sin blinds the sinner to the seriousness of sin. Sin enslaves the sinner to the power of sin. And sin warps the affections of the sinner to delight in sin. We would never think to transfer our sins to an innocent substitute because we don't naturally think our sins are bad enough to require such an abominable remedy. You think of this just back to animal sacrifice in the Old Testament that foreshadowed this work of Christ in 2 Corinthians 5.21. If you had a beloved, fluffy, perfect lamb, In your home, named, your children would squeeze it by the neck. And a day comes, a day of atonement, a day of sacrifice, and you and your children take Fluffy the sheep down to the temple and and hand it over to the priest and throat is slit and blood is let out and Fluffy expires. Why? Not because Fluffy was a bad sheep, but because you were a sinner. Do we naturally think our sins deserve that kind of awful treatment of an innocent victim? No, we don't don't think ourselves bad enough for that kind of thing. No one would come up with this out of the sea of sin that we're in and blinded by and enslaved to and delight in. And yet this is God's plan. To transfer our sins to an innocent substitute. And all of this requires faith. A kind of faith that a sinner himself could never put forward. Acts 18.27 describes Christians as those who believe through grace. (laughs) Do you know what that means? Belief itself comes By grace. Grace is the agency by which sinners believe in substitutionary atonement. The faith produced by a sinful human heart will never lead that sinner to eternal life. But faith introduced in the heart by grace opens the eyes, softens the inner disposition, and impels the sinner to acknowledge his sins against God and to run to Christ for forgiveness. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God of Ephesians 2.8. And notice the phrase, God made Jesus who knew no sin. God made Jesus to be sin on our behalf. This prepositional phrase is the language of substitution. A short, simple Greek preposition That makes the difference between heaven and hell. This on behalf of. uh, It means in the place of or instead of. It is a preposition of substitution. That an innocent victim was substituted for the vile sinner. To Jesus' person were transferred all of the sins of everyone who would ever believe. Past, present, and future. So that at the cross he became sin. Wrapped in our sins, clothed in our transgressions, they were laid upon him by his father. As the old hymn says, in my place condemned he stood. 
We see the Old Testament picture of these substitutions. In Genesis 3, right after the fall, with animal skin coverings, animals had to die so that sins could be covered. The ram in the place of Abram's son in Genesis 22, 13. The Passover of Exodus 12, the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16, and the sacrificial system for sin offerings throughout the temple practice. And in the New Testament, the New Testament writers employ heavy-hitting prepositions to convey this idea of substitution. And that is what we have here. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.21 echoes identification, substitution, and atonement that is found in Isaiah 53. Listen to the prophet's words. He, that is Jesus, was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb led to slaughter, like a sheep silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence. Nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. 700 years before Jesus came and died, in exquisite detail, God through the prophet Isaiah told his people what Messiah would come and do. There's no book like the Bible. There's no savior like Jesus And so there ought to be no confusion about any other way to heaven. And what happens here in 2 Corinthians 5.21 is is not simply a forensic declaration. Forensic means judicial or a, a court of law declaration. A legal declaration. Justification is a forensic declaration. Justification is that theological word that says God declares the sinner not guilty and positively righteous. That is a legal declaration in the courtroom of God. That is what justification means. What's happening here is the basis of a forensic declaration. What happens in 2 Corinthians 5.21 is the foundation from which that legal declaration could be made. This is a forensic transfer. Sinners can be declared not guilty of their sins precisely because and only because Christ became sin on our behalf. Actual sins and personal sinfulness were transferred to Christ in his person at the cross. And on that basis, God can declare the sinner not guilty and positively righteous. There could be no justification if there had not been actual transfer of sins and guilt to a substitute who would actually be able to bear them and actually be able to bear the infinite weight of divine retribution due them. This is why the Old Testament sacrificial system was a preview, a foretaste, a a foreshadowing. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sins. But God instituted them as an object of faith for his people to trust in God's provision to take away sins, which would one day be found in the person of Jesus Christ. A finite animal in the place of infinitely guilty, sinful humans couldn't assuage God's wrath eternally. They were provisional They were a shadow of what came in Christ. Only the Lord Jesus Christ could take away sins by a substitutionary death. That leads us to us. God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf 
so that we, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The we, the us here, uh, these are believers. And, and Paul has been talking about himself and his apostolic associates and their ministry and his own reconciliation to God and then describes ambassadorship. And we looked last week at how that ambassadorship includes all believers. And he makes his appeal, be reconciled to God. And then in verse 21 gives the content, the message of that reconciliation. And so the we, the us here is appropriately all believers, everyone who is reconciled to God. There is no other way to be reconciled to God than through the substitutionary death of Jesus. And notice what is said. This is a so that statement, a purpose or a result, so that we would become the righteousness of God in him. And our English versions use the word might. Do you see that in there? So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Might here is not a maybe or a perhaps or a could have, might here simply expresses purpose. I am going to eat lunch today, if the Lord allows, so that I might not starve. In my mind, there's no maybe about whether I'm going to eat lunch. Um, it, it describes purpose. It is, it is appropriate to think of this verse this way. God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we would become the righteousness of God in him. Uh, there's no confusion here. There's no maybe here. There's no hint of possibility here. This is just a grammatical way to describe purpose. And what's interesting grammatically, whenever you have a purpose statement like this in the New Testament, and God is the subject, God is the actor acting out his purpose, it also conveys the idea of result. Purpose and result are equal when God is the one doing the work. Why? Because he always gets what he wants. He sets out with his purpose to actually make us to be his righteousness. And that is actually what happens. The purpose here and the result here are the same. Notice what he does not say. God made Jesus to be sin on our behalf so that we could start trying hard to become righteous. Right? That is the Catholic view. That is, frankly, the Bible Belt cultural Christianity view. Uh, the, the, the kind of view that you, you grow up in America. I was born in Texas. If you're born in Texas, you're a Christian. It's just sort of how that works there. Uh, I don't mean in a saving way. I just mean culturally. And in the backdrop is that, oh yeah, Jesus died on the cross for my sin. Just rolls off without the thought of who Jesus is. And what his death means, what the cross was, uh, bearing the wrath of his father against my sin. And what it means that he died for me in my place as the substitute. I deserve that. Christ in my place. And this sort of cultural Christianity view is, yeah, Jesus died for you, so it's a good thing you're a pretty good person. Keep trying harder to be a good person. Hope you make it. That is not the Bible's message. This is not a Jesus died so you could maybe try harder. What is the purpose and the result here? God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we would become God's righteousness. This is not a process in view here. It is instantaneous, an unchangeable reality at the moment of faith. Listen, just as God identifies Jesus with sin that was totally foreign to him, so now God identifies believers, listen to this, with his own righteousness. That we would become the righteousness of God in Christ Declared righteous, based on a new ontological reality, a reality of being. We believers are the righteousness of God in him. Notice the parallel in the text. Just as Christ became sin on our behalf, so we also become the righteousness of God in Christ. Christ, being without sin, was treated as a sinner. In fact, he was treated as the greatest sinner, the, the, the concomitant uh, compilation of all the sins of everyone who would ever believe in one person, 
And so he bore in his person at the cross unspeakably more than any individual could ever bear. He was held to account for more sins than any individual will ever be held account for by unspeakable degrees of magnitude. And what is the exchange? We, the ungodly, are treated as perfectly righteous. This is what Paul echoes in his own testimony in Philippians 3. He says, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but a righteousness that comes from God by faith. That is, the believer is wrapped in God's righteousness, enveloped, clothed in it. This is how 2 Corinthians 5.19, God is not counting our trespasses against us because he has reckoned to Jesus' account my sin. And he has reckoned to my account his own perfect righteousness. And this is true for all who are in Christ. This is what theologians call imputation or reckoning or credit. Double credit. God credits Jesus with my sin and God credits me with his own righteousness. These are accounting terms. Theologians speak of double imputation. Our sin to Christ's account, God's righteousness credited to our account. That is here in this text. God was willing to view his son as sin. The embodiment of sin. Our sins imputed to his account so that he can view us as his righteousness. His own righteousness. Because we are found in Christ. God treated his son as if he had committed every sin of every believer of all time. God judiciously punished all of that sin to its fullest. To infinite degree. In keeping with the infinite wrath due sin. Coming from the immeasurably glorious goodness and justice of an infinite being. By the way, only an infinite being could absorb infinite wrath in a finite period of time at the cross. That's why there is no possible Savior outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's why if Jesus be not God, we have no Savior. God treated His Son as if He had committed every sin of every believer so that God could treat believers as if they had never done anything wrong and as if they had always done everything right. This is why in Romans 1.16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Why? Because in the gospel, the righteousness of God is manifested or made known, given freely as a gift on the basis of faith. Why is the gospel good news? Because the gospel gives you as a gift God's righteousness. And that is the only thing that will meet God's infinite standard for entrance into his presence in heaven. You cannot get to heaven without God's righteousness. And praise God, in the gospel, God provides it as a free gift to any who would believe. This in 2 Corinthians 5.21 is a forensic act, a legal act, a transfer of sin and the punishment of sin in that substitute. It leads to the forensic declaration, not guilty, righteous, and that leads to a qualification, entrance into God's glorious presence. And to step into God's glorious presence without this qualification, without this judicial declaration of not guilty and absolutely righteous, without the actual legal transfer of your sins to Christ on the cross, without that, to step into God's presence would mean to be incinerated forever by his white hot glory. Believers, rather, are qualified to stand in his presence blameless with great joy. Jude 24. Charles Hodge said this, Our sins were the judicial ground of the sufferings of Christ, so that they were a satisfaction of justice. And his righteousness is the judicial ground of our acceptance with God, so that our pardon is an act of justice. Do you understand the pardon in the gospel? It is not 
Go your way. We've all made mistakes. So you're the most heinous villain the earth could conceive of. You're a school shooter. Go your way. Pardoned. No, our pardon came at a price. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. It is not a winking at sin. It is not letting sinners go. It is the positive free gift of the righteousness that God's justice demands. And the full unflinching outpouring of God's justice against the sins committed. So that God can be just and the justifier of those who believe. And interestingly, the victim of our sins becomes the substitute to pay for them. By faith in Christ, the sinner has full confidence to approach God. Why? Because sins are actually forgiven. Conscience is cleansed. A declaration of righteousness has been forever declared. The prophet Isaiah continues, Isaiah 53.10, Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he would see his offspring, he would prolong his days, and the good pleasure of Yahweh will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. What did, what did it mean for Jesus to be the sin bearer? Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever asked in prayer, Jesus, what did it mean for you to be sin on my behalf? I mean, you hate sin. There's no sin in you. You're the same one who said, I have come to cast fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. And you said, but I have an immersion under the wrath of my father to undergo and how distressed of soul am I until it is accomplished. What did it mean for Jesus to be our sin bearer? If we could actually see what it was for God's son to bear the punishment for our sins, we would shudder in horror. If all we had an eye towards was the physical suffering of Jesus the Christ on the cross, we would shudder in horror, turn our eyes in fear and shame and say, somebody please make it stop. But if we could see behind the scenes what no human eye could see, but what Jesus experienced fully under the holiness of his Father, how God in all of his brilliant white-hot holiness hates sin we would shudder all over again to think about what that beloved son under the awful weight of his father's unflinching fury felt. What is it that he was anticipating in the garden of Gethsemane when he prayed and agonized and sweat drops of blood? When he cried out, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. What was that cup? The cup was the cup of his father's fury against sin that was not Jesus' sin. Friends, believers, it was your sin in that cup, my sin in that cup, that Jesus would be clothed in, wrapped up in, enveloped by, and then in that cup was the wine press of the father's fury against all of that sin. A fury that would never be extinguished if all of eternity was available to extinguish it in us, the sinner. Jesus, knowing he would bear these things, went willingly to the cross. He said, not my will, but your will be done. He said he came to lay down his life for sinners. Do you understand that for God to be for you, he had to be against his beloved son? 
for you, the condemned, to become uncondemnable, it meant that the irreproachable one had to be condemned. We who benefit from the cross of Christ will never comprehend fully what it meant for Christ to die in our place. We will never truly understand the blessings of eternal life. It will take us forever to figure those out. The only one deserving of the glories of eternity is the one who was condemned in our place to purchase them for us. And those who never comprehend their need for the cross of Christ will never benefit from it. Listen, if you're here this morning and you have not come to grips with your sin before a holy God, you are condemned already. And the wrath of God abides on you. And you are living now under a brief stay of execution. Every breath is borrowed. Every heartbeat is in God's hand. Friend, turn to Christ. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God has made a way. Because he loves sinners but he will not endure rejection and rebellion forever. What is our message? Our message is that of ambassadors of our king. Our king came, laid down his life, took it up again from the grave, and went home, and he's coming back. In his manifest absence, our job as his ambassadors is to populate his coming kingdom by boldly proclaiming this message, this message that is so close to blasphemous thought and yet is our only hope. God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we would become the righteousness of God in him. We ought to proclaim that to everything that moves on this earth. We carry this message. My friend Doug Briggs, a decades-long missionary to China, said of our ambassadorship from this text, it is not that God would have us go as his ambassadors because we're so capable. We carry more baggage than we could ever overcome. We have no power to change hearts. But God has ordained the means as well as the end. And the means is this message on the lips of us reconciled. What do we have besides our own baggage? These words. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The old hymn reflecting on Isaiah 53 says, Man of sorrows, it's on the screen for you, you can follow along. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Ruin sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we. Spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement can it be. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah. What a Savior. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransomed home to bring, this anew his song will sing. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, our maker, our king, our God, suffering servant, our redeemer, you've called us your friends. Thank you. To say thank you for such Infinite love is trite, small, puny, unworthy, and yet 
We know not what else to say. And so we sing with gratitude. We praise you with grateful hearts. We go out of this room as forgiven sinners, free of the slavery of sin, free of the penalty of sin, one day free of the very presence of sin. And we go out of here as your ambassadors, sinners redeemed, the vile reconciled, missionaries, evangelists, make us so for your glory. God, would you be pleased to draw people to yourself even this week by our feeble testimony of your incredible power. And may your lamb, our savior, receive the reward of his suffering.